Hey everyone, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And in this short video, we're going to discuss how to determine the hybridization state of atoms in some simple compounds. Before we get to determining the hybridization states of central atoms, let's think about why we need to understand hybridization at all and what it helps us to explain. Consider this methane molecule, CH4. And notice that all four of the carbon-hydrogen bonds in this molecule are identical. They have exactly the same bond lengths, bond angles, and bond energies. And this was determined experimentally in the early 1900s. There's a problem with it, though, in that that violates what we thought we knew about atomic structure. Let me explain. Consider the atomic orbitals of a carbon atom, here plotted on an energy diagram. I have my 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 ground state configuration for carbon. Now imagine I'm ready to make some bonds to four hydrogens. Well, naturally, I'll need to promote one of my 2s electrons up to the p subshell in order to get everything ready. Now my carbon atom is ready to create four bonds. No problem there. However, consider this. This particular carbon atom would make one bond to a hydrogen using its s atomic orbital and then three bonds to hydrogens using its p atomic orbitals. This model predicts that methane should have three identical carbon hydrogen bonds and a fourth carbon hydrogen bond that has a different length, strength, and angle to the others. And yet we know from scientific observation that this is not true. In order to account for this, in the early 1930s, renowned physical chemist Linus Pauling proposed that maybe atomic orbitals can hybridize. They can blend together and share their properties. For example, the carbon atom here that has a 2s and a 2p subshell could allow those orbitals to hybridize, forming a different type of orbital, one that has some s character and some p character. When this happens, notice what we've done. When we populate this system with our electrons, we find that we now have a carbon atom that has four orbitals ready to bond, all of which are identical to one another. So this new orbital structure around our carbon atom allows it to make four bonds to hydrogens, all of which are identical. That's because we've combined one s orbital with three p orbitals to create four new hybrid orbitals that we call sp3. Looking back at the structure of methane, it's clear to see that hybridization is the best way to explain this. The atomic orbital system has failed us, but Linus Pauling's idea of hybrid orbitals seems to explain the problem. Now let's look at how we can use this notion to determine the hybridization state of the central atom of a number of different compounds. Now let's take a look at how to determine exactly what the hybridization state is in a given central atom in a given molecule. In order to determine the hybridization state of any central atom, we really need to only consider three fundamental rules. The first rule is this, sigma bonds and lone pairs occupy hybrid orbitals. However, pi bonds do not. So what this means is if our central atom has a lone pair, we're going to count that as needing one hybrid orbital. If our central atom has a single bond, again, all single bonds are sigma bonds, and so we'll count that as well. But if our central atom has double or triple bonds, we only count the first of those multiple bonds because all of the subsequent bonds that go in there are pi bonds. So our double bond counts as one and our triple bond also counts only as one when determining the number of hybrid orbitals around the central atom. Rule number two, the number of hybrid orbitals that we get out based on our need has to equal the number of atomic orbitals that went in to get those hybrids. For example, if we determine from our sigma bond and lone pair count that we need two hybrid orbitals around a central atom, we know we have to use two atomic orbitals to make them. If instead we find that we have a need for three hybrid orbitals, we would use three atomic orbitals and so on. The third and final rule is that atomic orbitals will participate in order of increasing energy. We always begin with S, then progress to P, and finally, if necessary, use D atomic orbitals to determine our hybridization. For example, hybridizations like SP, SP2, SP3, SP3D, 
and sp3d2 are all commonly found. However, other hybridizations do not occur. For example, you can't have an SD, SPD2, or PD2, because in these examples, I failed to use the lowest energy set of atomic orbitals necessary to create the hybrid orbitals that I need. Now that we understand the three essential rules for determining hybridization states, let's apply those rules in a few examples. Now let's use our rules to determine the hybridization states of a few central atoms. Here's some common molecules that you may encounter in your chemistry course. Carbon dioxide, boron trifluoride, methane, phosphorus pentachloride, and sulfur hexafluoride. We always begin, of course, by determining the Lewis structure of these compounds. That will help us to figure out what the electronic structure is around the central atom. For example, in carbon dioxide, we would obtain this Lewis structure. Boron trifluoride would give us this and so on, and of course you can use your own knowledge and rules of Lewis structures to determine these for yourself. Once I've determined the Lewis structures for my compounds, I need to look at that central atom and assess exactly how many sigma bonds and lone pairs there are. So let's count up all the sigma bonds and lone pairs to help us determine the hybridization state of our central atoms. Starting with sigma bonds, Carbon dioxide has two because remember those double bonds each count as only one sigma bond plus a pi bond. Boron trifluoride would have three, methane four, phosphorus pentachloride five, and sulfur hexafluoride six. You'll notice that in this example, none of these compounds has any lone pairs at all. This is going to make my counting very simple. So in the case of carbon dioxide, where I have two sigma bonds and no lone pairs, I would have to have an sp hybridization. Two hybrid orbitals out means I had to put two atomic orbitals in. In the case of boron trifluoride, I would have an sp2 hybridization. Again, three hybrid orbitals out means I had to put three atomic orbitals in, in order of increasing energy. That's an s and two p. Next, let's take a look at methane. Here we have four, so an sp3. In phosphorus pentachloride, sp3d, I've had to bring a d orbital in to be sure that I have the five hybrid orbitals necessary to accommodate all of those sigma bonds. And finally, sulfur hexafluoride, in which I would have sp3d2. Now let's take a look at a few more examples that do have lone pairs and see how that affects determining their hybridization states. Now let's take a look at just a few more compounds that you're likely to encounter in your general chemistry course. Here I have sulfur dioxide, water, sulfur tetrafluoride, and xenon tetrafluoride. And just as before, I'm going to draw their Lewis structures now, paying particular attention to the electronic structure about the central atom. And when I do so, I discover that all four of these compounds contain not only sigma bonds, but also lone pairs. And so this will become very important in determining the hybridization state of the central atom. Once again, I'm going to count sigma bonds and lone pairs and use that to determine the hybridization state of the central atom. Sulfur dioxide, for example, contains two sigma bonds and just one lone pair. This means that I have to have three hybrid orbitals about that central sulfur atom. And my recipe for three hybrid orbitals is sp2. Looking at water, we also have two sigma bonds, but in this case, the central atom now has two lone pairs of electrons for a total of four hybrid orbitals, meaning I need to use four atomic orbitals to create them. And the recipe for that, of course, is sp3. Next, I have sulfur tetrafluoride, in which I have four sigma bonds, but only one lone pair. This means I need a total of five hybrid orbitals, which would mean I have an sp3d hybridized central atom. Finally, looking at xenon tetrafluoride, xenon has four sigma bonds and two lone pairs for a total of six hybrid orbitals necessary. Six hybrid orbitals out means I put six atomic orbitals in. And in order of increasing energy, that means sp3d2 is the recipe for the hybridization about that central xenon atom. Thanks for watching my video on determining hybridization states. I hope you find it helpful and I hope you come back for the next video. But that's all for now. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. See you on my next video.